Hey everyone, it's Susan Lindner. I am your host of the Innovation Storyteller Show and I am excited. Why? Because I've been working with startups for about 25 years now and I have to say there have been some innovations in the way that startups are handled, right? We saw the advent of the incubator, the accelerator over time, um, but rarely has an organization come along that really helps startups get the traction they need with customers and especially understanding and navigating the minefield that is the open market. Whether startups are working with big companies, whether they're partnering with other smaller businesses or gaining inspiration and contacts from much bigger networks. And that's why I'm really excited to have Wayne Batarif on the call with me today, on the line with me today, where we're talking about plug and play. If you don't know about plug and play, it's time to get plugged in. So a little bit about my guest, Wayne Batarif is the founder of energy and the sustainability practice at plug and play, something that's near and dear to all of us innovators. Plug and Play is the largest corporate innovation center and one of the most active early stage investors globally. We're not dealing with small fries here, people. Wade works closely with entrepreneurs and corporate innovation leaders and investors with a focus on the energy industry value chain, which we're going to dive into today. Previously, Wade worked in solar, published scientific articles, and led business development efforts in a startup. Wayne holds a very impressive master's degree in chemical engineering and a master's degree in petroleum and natural gas engineering, and his passion is at the intersection of tech and business. So welcome to the show, Wade. I'm so happy to have you here. It's a pleasure to, to have me here, and thank you so much. It's uh, such an honor to join your show, uh, Susan. It's great to be here. Thank you. So tell us, Wade, how did you get into this business, this crazy world of startups? How'd you get here? Absolutely. So yeah, I my career starts back in 2015 when I graduated from school. I kind of uh, delved deeper into the world of more people-centric careers and pivoted from deep science and math behind everything to business development and sales-oriented uh, jobs. And I started working in, in a solar company in Southern California where we we're in charge of growing the business. And that's when I kind of got a sense of how we built rapport with the customers. And I, I was able to identify some technological gaps that would increase our sales revenue and help us more, help us with more efficient ways to get to the customers and bring them into the platforms that we had. And back in 2016, when I joined Plug and Play to be closer to technology and, and my family here, I was introduced to plug and play and to me plug and play was a, a really amazing platform where we could see the both ends of the spectrum from one hand with startups entrepreneurs that are trying to tackle some of the biggest challenges in the world and on the other hand large corporations that were looking at these challenges but from a completely different angle and uh, being able to learn from from these two different complete stakeholders and try to facilitate introductions between those two and learn from them and be part of some of their journeys by becoming an investor was, it, it sounded really enticing. And I joined Plug and Play back in 2016. And at the time, there were a number of large energy companies that were coming to Silicon Valley to shop for strategic investments and partnerships with startups. And Plug and Play at the time didn't have a, a full-fledged practice focused on this industry vertical. And that's when I met our, our CEO and founder, Saeed Amidi, he alluded into the fact that we should have a dedicated practice. And that's when I came on board and, and the rest was, was a, a hell of a journey from there. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, Saeed Amidi is one of the top investors in Silicon Valley. He's been around for about 30 years now and invested in little companies that you might've heard of like PayPal and Danger and Dropbox and Lending Club, right? So you might know a thing or two about where to put smart money. Is that right? It's a very fascinating story. The plug and play story is, is unique in and of itself. How did they yeah. do it plug and play? It's the story of like Rugs to Riches, basically our CEO and founder. He, he has a number of different businesses. And when he immigrated from Iran about 40 years ago, in the late 90s, he had a good amount of commercial real estate. 
on University Avenue here in, in Palo Alto next to Stanford. And as luck would have it, we had an extra office space in some of these buildings and, and lent it out to uncredit worthy entrepreneurs at the time. And these entrepreneurs included like Larry and Sergey from Google and, and Max Levshin and Peter Thiel from PayPal. And he, he they were able to make a couple of investments through the family office that turned out to be wildly successful. And that really all changed in 2006 when we took the facility that we are today. I'm speaking out of our headquarter in Sunnyvale, which is right between Google and Apple headquarter. And we built on top of the platform a much grander investment strategy and portfolio. We've also layered in many different areas for which it helps the startups to get to market faster at a cheaper rate and much more expedient for all parties involved. And I'm happy to kind of dive a little bit deeper into that. But what we try to do is to try to pair up these startups uh, with some of the larger corporations that are seeking technology needs. Yeah. And what an incredible thing to do. I know so many of our listeners who are involved in corporate intrapreneurship, and part of that is involved with bringing startups on board. What do you think is, so for those of you who have already in this strategy, or some of you are contemplating the strategy, or maybe some of you have done this thing of working with startups and it failed miserably because you didn't know how to live and breathe in the culture of startups or teach them how to live and breathe in the culture of corporations. What do you think when you look at it, what's a good match? How do you know when it's a good fit between a startup and a grown up? It's a great question. And, and that's one that we get to try to tackle every day because as I mentioned, plug and play on one hand, we do large corporate innovation consulting practice with more than 550 clients that come to us constantly with specific use cases they want to build. And these are innovation leaders from some of the you know old traditional industries like financial sector, insurance companies, retail companies, banking, manufacturing, industrials, oil and gas, utilities, automotive industry, and so on and so forth, about 20 of them. And they share with us what specific use cases they want to build in the any given business unit. And what we do on, on our hand, we go travel around the world. We try to find startups that can check all of the boxes they're looking for. And these could be from a technology readiness level standpoint. It could be from where they're located, how much money they've raised, how much, how many customers they have, what is their addressable target market. And we try to conduct a fair amount of due diligence on both ends to make sure that we, when we facilitate introduction in these private meetings, what we call deal flows, where we had about uh, 2,000 sessions last year alone, we try to make sure that both parties know what the expectations are, how much risk and cost is associated with that, and what is the anticipated outcome. Once we facilitate these introductions, we try to play less of a hands-on role so that we can see what companies can gain traction early on collectively from some of their potential corporate clients that we introduce to them. And we use that as a signal from the market. And then when we, we aggregate these signals, we find what companies are rising to the surface organically. And then we go back to those companies and we offer our own investment deal to them from the private single family office. So it's been a pretty fascinating platform where a group of experts actually interact with these startups, whether they're early stage or mature. And by the way of working with them, conducting a pilot project, proof of concept, if they're super early stage or doing a commercial agreement or licensing or acquisition in their market, we can see which companies actually have a, a future. We also conduct a little bit of our own angel type vetting mechanism where um, you know, we look at several hundred startups every month and about a few thousand every year. We see the trends of the market and based on the trends based on the, the capabilities of the team and their IP strategy, their other investors, we can determine roughly what are some of the good companies that we should invest in. So that investing side is one piece, but something I've heard from so many people on this show, that if you want to work with startups, you had better have an internal, not only advocate, right? For number one, the problem that has to get solved, but number two, for the startup that, that you're partnering with, who's really going to stand there with like a sword and a shield to cut through all the corporate red tape to help that startup be successful inside of the organization. And that advocate has to be kind of talking to other people and knocking down silo walls for this to really happen, even when you're just doing a really limited scope, prototype, agile, 
let's say sprint for a particular problem that you're solving, you really need that strong internal advocate. Is that right? In fact, this is part of the requirement before we form a partnership in order to qualify a corporate member. We, what we try to do is we have a set of minimum requirements. And one of them is, which is the most important ask that we have is time. And oftentimes we have a parallel that we draw to like a, an organization like plug and place, like a gym where you get the gym membership, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have gains. But if you start working out in it, if you're working out in it and spending time and dedicating resources to it, that's when you start seeing the results. And to that end, we ask for having dedicated points of contact within that large corporate who are whose job is primarily to liaise between the two networks and be the receiver of technologies for the demand owners and have a good understanding of the technology landscape and know the language of the corporate that they, they live in and translate that to the needs of their business unit owners and help them understand how it fits into their specific needs and how they can build or, or shepherd some of these external technologies to their specific use case they want to build or their product or service they want to create. Yeah. Um, you and I were talking before I hit record on this podcast about a certain brown bubbly beverage company whose name will not be mentioned <laughs> when I asked their head of innovation, how come you don't work with startups? He said, oh, we've tried, but we've murdered every startup that's walked through our door because there are just all these layers around localizing for 151 languages on day one or hitting every cybersecurity requirement in the organization. And you get that there's risk and there's safety and all that other stuff that has to be there. And yet that's a really rough environment for a startup to try to exist in especially when there are 40 people CC'd on every email and you're like, I don't even know who half these people are, but apparently I now have 10,000 masters that I didn't know I had when I started my two Neds in a shed kind of company, right? Me and my best friend came up with this cool idea. And now what? <laughs> exactly. You know, you're absolutely right in that reconciling internally, all of the, the dots that need to be in line and uh, having the, the right advocates internally is extremely important. And Oftentimes, because there are so many approvals that need to be uh, acquired within a large corporate, the startups really have to be careful on what projects they they take on. They need to do their own due diligence to make sure that they're working with the right partners within their corporate kind of landscape of opportunities. And I'd say there are some organizations that are more successful than others in terms of building those muscles that can help them work with startups by creating these risk-free environments and sandboxes that, you know, without putting the, the the core of the business into the risk or jeopardy, they can bring the startup, give them a, a set of synthetic data, have them validate their solution. And with that proof of the, the technology, they can then go back to the business unit and say, look, this technology worked. We plugged in all the numbers. We conducted this research. All we need is having someone on your team to champion this idea and hopefully get to the commercialization stage. Yeah. So what's the advice for what's the advice for the big boys out there who are listening and girls, excuse me. But what what's the advice for big companies? Like what's the easy thing that we can think about when we say I have a problem, I don't know how to solve it, but I believe there's technology or there there are people out there who have solved this problem before and know how to solve it. Mm -hmm. When's the right time to come and find plug and play for a corporate that's a great question, um, Susan, and thanks for asking. I think there is a whole range of things that are important when it comes to working with startups. I, I would say from my perspective and what, what we observe that plug and play, the most common theme that we have and some of the most successful corporations that have worked with startups are the ones that have been able to get the leadership engagement. So if there's a top-down support. If Wait, how far are we talking? Are we talking CEO level or can we get like head of division level and that's still okay? I'd say uh, anyone from the C-suite would be fantastic. If it's a CEO, it's great. But we also have like chief innovation officers, chief technology officers, chief strategy officers oftentimes that are very forward thinking and innovative and advocate of innovation. And they understand that their business is poised to the disruption if, if they don't mobilize the resources internally. Good but point. and I think that is one of the most common um, success metric that we've seen is how much executive leadership support we have. 
and how much of that translates into actionable items that trickle down the hierarchical chain of the company from the VP level to director to managers that are on the ground every day sourcing new technologies and trying to present these new opportunities to the business units. But I think from the min, from a long list of requirements for being able to roll out a new technology and, and find them from the external ecosystem, I'd say the, the executive leadership support is, is one of the most critical ones. Yeah. And so, okay, so we get buy-in, right? So I need some new fintech product. I'm the CFO of a big company. I say, yes, I give the green light to working with a startup. When do I come, when do I know the need is so great that I come to a place like plug and play and forgive me, is it best to be in the plug and play network before you have a need? So you get to talk to lots of other people, or is it better to show up when like, I have a specific ask, help me find the startup who can help? I think that's a great question, Susan. I think every company has their own unique signature needs and uh, they're in different phases of innovation in their journey. And in my perspective, just being at, at plug and play, I think changing the culture of the company doesn't happen overnight. So there's a lot of trials that need to, to be taking place before we can land on the big project that can scale across the organization and change the enterprise model. And for that, the sooner this action is taken, the better, because at the end of the day, it's a numbers game. And meaning that from many pilot projects that we do, most of them may fail. But in order to find those that are going to actually change the business and impact the bottom line of it, we got to start early on. Otherwise, in the competitive landscape, others would do it. And we may get into the phase that it's too late or the startups are too expensive to acquire. So I think the sooner we get into the external innovation, dedicate some resources, allocate some budget, and create an environment where uh, the champions, the, the those who are on the ground, they're actually incentivized and they're praised for the number of projects that they do, and they're not pointed fingers at. And I think the sooner we start doing that, the better. And that's, there's a lot of examples I can share in which a company didn't jump on the wagon fast enough and they weren't able to catch up again anymore. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Tell us about some of the mistakes you've watched corporate make, corporates make when they're trying to do business with small businesses. Yeah. So some of uh, the examples are, it, it may sound pretty intuitive, but for instance, when corporations want to hog the companies and try to limit their growth based on their own strategic purposes and try to fit them in the fit the startups into the mold of a corporate we see that the startups growth will be hindered by those corporates even though some of these corporates may have been the biggest brands in the world or the biggest uh, player in their own sector but because they didn't have the right processes in place they limited the growth of the startups because oftentimes when we're talking about a, a venture backable startup company, we are looking at a hockey stick growth, an exponential growth trajectory that they need the right partners in order to have the, the agility, the nimbleness, the freedom to scale their technology. And if a large group of paper comes and tries to put them in the boxes that they have defined in their own processes, the startups will get a golden handcuff and they won't be able to uh, achieve their uh, shareholders' expectations, uh, goals or meet their expectations. So to that end, I'd say there's been cases where some of the big oil companies that we work with or industrials, manufacturing companies, they have invested in a company and they took majority shares in the company and they took away the, the board from the startups the role that they were able to play was not as productive as the companies were expected. And that that misunderstanding about what the actual, is that something you set up at the beginning or it's something that you find out along the way? I think there, there are, there, over the past 10, 15 years, the corporate innovation landscape has evolved and there's there are a lot of lessons learned and certain companies have been able to build credibility and through that credibility, the startups would know that this company is very well trained to work with startups. 
So they are more approachable. They, they have more open doors. And if they participate or, or join the journey of the startups, they're not going to limit their growth. There are some that you would know based on some of the research and asking from the other startups that they have in their portfolio. I think one of the key steps in qualifying the client is that to see what they've done in the past with startups. Is it their first time that the, they're working with a startup or have they done projects as such before? And if they haven't, they I think they should have a really candid conversation around how quickly they want to grow the business, how much of their control they want to give away and how much, what's the scope of the project that they want to do with the company. And if they have some good traction, if they have good investors, they won't feel a dire need to do any project that the clients give them, but more so do the projects that can align with their mission of scaling their technology and, and products and solution the way that they have planned initially. Yeah. And what do you think about the startups themselves? Where do they screw it up? Yeah. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, us being very early stage investors, a, a good number of uh, investments that we make don't make it to finish line. And that is oftentimes because of a few different reasons. One being the the founders don't get along because the company goes through a lot of different pivots and the, 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 the vision that they initially shared together doesn't necessarily align anymore because of conflicts that arise and their ability to resolve conflicts. And when the founders, when the founders divorce happened, then it's hard to put the company back together. That's one of the most common challenges that I've seen. The other one is certain industries have cyclical nature, meaning that the startups don't plan ahead and don't prepare themselves for economic downturn and they find themselves in a valley of death because of their potential customers slowing down and they can't raise enough capital or they can't sign customers quick enough. And um, because of their high burn rate, they won't be able to secure the next round of funding. So that's another one. And the third one is- great for a particular reason, right? I mean, you very easily get burned in this process if you're not prepared. Yeah, exactly. And then of course, sometimes- the startups don't, especially because we focus on B2B startups for the most part. I think there's a, a key consideration for a startup founder to know what's the language that potential customer speaks. Like, for instance, if you are going to present a new technology to like an electric utility or an oil and gas company, you got to make sure that the culture that you they have been in for a long time, it not it doesn't necessarily have like a Facebook, Amazon, or, or Google type culture. And you've got to be able to speak their language. You've got to be able to put yourself in your shoes and understand their challenges really well. And sometimes the startups who especially come out of the tech industry and want to tackle some of the other old industries, they don't take that into consideration and they won't be able to sell corporate clients and they fail in a way. So is that part of your job? Let's shift a little bit to talk about your industry. Is that part of your job is helping them navigate how to speak petroleum? <laughs> it's partially that, exactly. Oil, but yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. So I think part of the reason that in my practice, we're really excited about facilitating startup projects into the oil and gas industry is because it, it has a very critical impact on the fighting climate change because any innovation in that sector equates to some sort of emission reduction or reducing our global carbon emissions. And to that end, the oil and gas industry from the upstream to downstream, exploration, production, midstream and downstream are part of the practice that we focus on. And they look at a range of different technologies. It usually falls into key, two key buckets. One is technologies that can help them do their business better today. Like how can they bring data analytics, sensors, softwares that can better optimize their warehouses or supply chain management and things like that. Or the other one is the technologies that can build the future of their businesses, how they look at the intersection of, let's say, the oil and gas industry and the transportation industry. As we all see, the world is committing to a net carbon zero goal and they need help to understand you know, where these emissions come from and how to reduce those emissions, how to account for those emissions. 
And so the, the cross collaboration between the oil and gas, electric utilities and the energy industry as a whole with the rest of the world and pollinating with them, cross pollinating, I think it's a very exciting opportunity. I think it's where most of the tangible projects that have emerged come from. And that's part of what we do every day within our my practice at Plug and Play. It's fascinating to me because I haven't been in a room with chief innovation officers in the last year that did not have a climate goal. And I can certainly say that four years ago, sustainability and innovation weren't necessarily walking hand in hand down the aisle. Um, but now um, it's a way to kind of click off two boxes on how are we innovating and how are we saving the planet all in one spot. And I wish I wish more folks in the innovation space would be actively talking about this, but I think sometimes the prototypes are so new that not everyone has results to report at the moment. And so everybody's kind of working feverishly and then suddenly, boom, AI shows up on the scene. And now we're like, like three years ago, all I heard was blockchain, right? And then sustainability came in crashing through. I think it was like COP27 or maybe it was COP26 that like beat us over the head and we're like, oh crap. And different political figures have different feelings about that. And so whether Greta Thunberg standing on the top of an iceberg somewhere yelling at us or we define it for ourselves, there's there's these constant disruptions, even in the innovation space that say, oh, what is the flavor of the week? Oh, we're going green this week. Oh, okay. We're going AI this week. Great. How do you keep the focus on climate sustainability when there are so many other priorities that are pulling at people? A really great question. Thanks for bringing that, Susan. And, and I think it's uh, one that is really near to my heart and we try to advocate for this um, every day at Plug and Play because about two and a half years ago, we formed the the the, the world has completely changed from when we started tackling this uh, clean tech 2.0 uh, in 2016, and um, the venture community was shying away from anything capital intensive and hardware based technologies. But today, as you said, almost everyone has made a commitment to reduce their carbon footprint. When we launched our joint venture with the Alliance to End Plastic Waste about three years ago, that's when we put a full-fledged effort behind this mission. And we have been, over the past three years, uh, able to build a standalone division that is focused on sustainability. And we have been able to, to bring stakeholders from across many different sectors. Within that practice, the only mission statement is how can we find technologies that can help us reduce uh, our carbon emissions and fight uh, climate change. And then there's, and, and that's when you see like the, the, the cross collaboration start happening. And I think that's where it organically creates opportunities for, let's say a large automotive company to sit down with an electric utility provider or a, a shipping company or railroad and talk about what is it that they're doing? What are the challenges that they're facing? And how can they work together to accelerate the adoption of new technologies that can help them achieve their goals? And I think it's been a really exciting time. You're right. There's hype cycles that happen. And as the nature of our, our business would have it here in Silicon Valley, we are looking to take advantage of the opportunities and make sure that we, we get some of the best entrepreneurs in our ecosystem and, and work with them and join their journey. But at the same time, we have dedicated some of these practices that are purely focused on some of the um, uh, the mission statements that are, as you said, a, a double bottom line effect that not only brings a financial return, but also impacts our climate in a way that our customers, shareholders, ourselves, and our employees would require us to do so. Yeah. I just, I would love to hear also from my listeners of how you're doing this. How are you keeping up with this endless struggle as you from the hype cycle? I don't know a sole executive at the board level who has not been asked for an AI strategy for their particular division. Like it just doesn't exist. Figure out how to create efficiencies and fire those lawyers. If we can get them to, if we can get the machines to do the work, then do it. And I'm going to hear from a lot of lawyers now, but- <laughs> Which is okay too. I'd love to get some chief innovation attorneys on here to tell I'm us. 
cultivating their practices too. Yeah, that would be a fantastic conversation. And you know, <laughs> the way we we go about it is over the course of a year, we build a very curated program to the needs of every single partner individually, meaning that over over the course of the year, we we have a bi-monthly session where we dive deeper into a specific topic where they share their top technology pain points and priorities. And we build in an elite list of companies that can match all of those criteria very well. And then we have these mini kind of shark tank on steroid happen in a private setup where each company that they have hierarchic ranked and chosen to meet with, they come and give a 30 minute pitch of their technology. And then with the goal that half of these companies will go and sign an NDA and uh, through that kind of break down their technology, show what is the impact that they'll have on, on, on the bottom line of the business, how much carbon they can reduce or how much business they can bring or how do they change the customer experience. We, they clearly scope out the project and they do a proof of concept. And out of those half, we hope that half of those will end up in a strategic partnership, whether it's licensing, acquisition, investment, or any other uh, exclusivity deal that they may have. And then we iterate for the next challenge to a, a completely different topic. So let's say if the first topic was through AI applications for understanding their customer behavior, the next one can be, let's say, robotic automation solutions for their warehouse. And then we do the same process. We repeat that and we focus on a different topic. During this, the course of this challenge, we engage the right stakeholders within that corporate, meaning that if it's the automation for the warehouse, we will have the warehouse innovators or the warehouse innovation unit attend this session, participate and engage, and hopefully find those startups quicker than uh, any other way. And we do this on a large scale. So we do this in, in 50 locations around the world with 550 clients. And then we bring the data back to a central database and try to identify based on a, a very data-driven approach which companies are gaining traction and which ones are are not. And then we relay that feedback back to those corporate partners and, and try to help them mitigate the risk of working with them. Yeah. So your summit is coming up next week. This is a really big deal in Silicon Valley. So how many people are you expecting at the Plug and Play Summit this year? It's the most exciting event of the year for us. We have about 3,000 attendees at our Sunnyvale headquarter. We are showcasing the latest cohort of our 20 industry specific verticals. We have launched six new locations in the in this quarter that we're gonna uh, announce during the summit. Wait, in this uh, quarter? Six that's new- right. it's, uh, it's been a an exponential growth for us in the US, mainly thanks to some government uh, acts like IRA or CHIPS Act that have unlocked a lot of uh, grant for from the federal level to different states. And the states are now putting a lot of effort for the economical developments of the region, and they're bringing plug and play to all these different places. So we have uh, a ton of government officials, public figures from different states and even different countries. We have pavilions and about 250 startups that will be showcasing their technology on the stage over the course of a week in different themes and different sessions throughout the day. So we would love for any of uh, your listeners, yourself, and everyone in the community to join us in the next summit. And I'll be more than happy to connect and learn. My email is wade at pmptc.com, and I'll be gladly sharing more information about our upcoming ones. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, this is a very hot ticket. It's also almost a $4,000 ticket. So if you're going, you better be serious. This is a great opportunity. But but the people that you meet at the Plug and Play Summit are really of the highest caliber. And there are people who are thinking about this intersection of startup and grown up that really makes innovation happen here and around the world. It's that combination of spark and fire, right? Of that young spark and this big fire that really can drive things so fast when it's done right. So Wade, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate all of your insights and also helping us look at fossil fuels and looking at the petroleum and the energy industry in a way that is going to shape the future of how we get our energy in in the future. So thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Susan. Thank you for having me on the show and 
Thank you for hosting this great podcast and look forward to the future activities together. And where can people find you? I know you gave us your email address. What's the best place to connect with you? Are you a LinkedIn guy? I'm a really active person on LinkedIn. You can easily find me Wade Bitaraf on LinkedIn. And please shoot me a note. If you're a startup, you want to send over your overview deck, happy to look at it and share with the right colleagues, if not in my space. Or if you're a corporate or in- investor, you want to participate in the ecosystem, same thing. You can shoot me a quick note and I'm excited to have a conversation about your organization. Wayne Bataraf from Plug and Play. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan.